We'll start off today with a presentation on road networks and destinations. Before I jump in, are there any questions um, regarding yesterday or the course in general? Great, you're all ready to go. Full copy. Yeah. Yeah, it, and it depends. You, so, pseudo structures, one way, um, if you really don't know where they're going to be, you can bump up your population just globally. So, assign them just globally throughout your population area. Um, it's a little bit tricky. We can talk about it offline too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, I'm going to talk uh, next 45 minutes about road networks and destinations, uh, the importance of each one. Start off going over road networks. Uh, we're all going to become traffic engineers today, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Road networks, um, they represent all the possible evacuation routes that agents can take. It's de defined as a, as, a, as a line segment shape, um, and it's stored in your .fire file. Um, Key attributes of a road network are the road classification data. Uh, they're called CFCCs. That's a, that's a, has this term for common feature classification code. And it's really just a code that helps define, it's almost like an occupancy type for structures. It's a code that helps define certain attributes about each road segment, such as number of lanes, free flow speed, um, and so on. Flow direction is also important with road networks. I mentioned yesterday in the live sim overview that directionality is important for one-way roads. So the directionality of that road network is important. And then vertical offsets. Vertical offsets I'm going to talk about a little bit later in this presentation represent um, situations where you have a bridge where you have water flowing under the bridge, but the uh, sample depths and velocities at that bridge would actually show that the depths under the bridge. So it's a way to, to fix that issue. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, road networks are saved in the .fia file. Um, that's, your, that's your life sim study file. And they're imported from either a shape file or an open street map. This is a really, really nice tool because um, one of the biggest challenges as we started building life sim models was, um, was the road network. It was really not an easy thing to get. We'd look around and try to find um, good available data. Um, looked into tiger lines, that was a, a federal federal effort, and there were issues there where you'd have overlapping road segments, and if you have 30 overlapping road segments that are connected, then you're saying that there's essentially infinite volume of vehicles that can drive through, so it created all kinds of issues. OpenStreetMap really, really made things a lot easier. It's a really solid data set around the world. It's been um, contributed to by major corporations like Microsoft, and um, and you can just import directly for your study area right into your model. So it's really saved us a lot of heartache in terms of, um, in terms of building that road network. Importing some shapefiles is very easy, right? If you have a shapefile of, the, of your road segments that you want to use, um, maybe you got it from another source, maybe you made it by hand, whatever the case, you can import that from a shapefile. Um, and then when that's the case, you need to require, you're required to provide the CFCC codes. For that, for that road network. Otherwise, the other ones are optional. Importing for OpenStreetMap, very easy. You just provide your bounding polygon, and then it can, it'll import all the roads within that bounding polygon. One really, really nice feature, though, is a lot of times we want, we want all the roads within our primary area where all of our structures are, right? We want those residential streets to capture people on, on the minor roads. But when you get out beyond your, your primary residential area, your primary study area, when you're looking at people evacuating out, you really only want the major roads, generally. You don't want the little subsurface roads and, and residential streets because people aren't going to be taking those for evacuation. Yeah. Uh, no, you're talking about like a preloading of the road network, like already on there. It doesn't do it automatically. You can you can set the model up to mimic that. So when you set up a model, you set, and we'll go through this in the presentation, but you'll set your destinations, and then vehicles will try to drive to those destinations. So you can set up structures outside of your study area that are pointing at destinations on wherever you want that traffic to go, and then it'll simulate that traffic going through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so OpenStreetMap is really, really nice. You set up your bounding polygon, and then you can set up a buffer. So, okay, within my bounding polygon, it's going to import everything. But, with, but a buffer region out from the edge of my polygon, and you can define that buffer length, in this case, five miles, it's going to, it's only going to select these roads that are checked down here. Which is a really nice feature to get those, those major roads. Another, fa another factor in here is to find the maximum road length. Remember that's important because I'll, I'll be talking about that in a little bit is how the, the depth and velocities are sampled at the roads. That maximum road length can have a, have a big impact on how the hydraulics are being sampled. Just showing an example with that buffer. So here's a, here's a screenshot of no buffer, right? So if you just, if you set that buffer distance to zero miles, and you import your own network, it would look like this. But what if you're concerned about, what if you assume people are gonna only evacuate east and west on that major road? As soon as they reach the, the edge of their inundation area, they're not safe. They're still driving along this road for a while and you wanna be able to capture that, be, that traffic backing up on that. So you set that buffer and then you can import all the, the primary roads outside of that area. Really nice, quick, easy thing, yeah. You Like yes, exactly. Yeah. So motorway is like a freeway. Um, trunk, I think, is it says there's a description for each one here. But yeah, it's just a description. No, no, no. If you don't, I'll go back once. Options for importing road network. Import from OpenStreetMap, which goes to the web and pulls it down from the web, and then import from a shapefile. So if you had your own, it was in a shapefile. Then you would just use the import from shapefile option, and what you would need to define is your your CFCC name field, which is your common feature classifications. Yeah. So there are two different options. If you had your own, you would use this option. If you have an OpenStreetMap, you don't have to really think about all that stuff. It's going to import it all for you directly. No, you wouldn't have to use the trunk primary. You would have to follow the CFCC codes, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. simulation model because it can allow for traffic to be building up beyond your inundation area which that can then extend into your inundation area cfcc data so we just talked about i was going to talk about the what the cfcc codes mean um cfcc codes are, like i said are common feature classification codes they're standard based on hazards and they go with a10 through b a bunch b something um but it's like a10 a11 a12 and so on. And each classification has a description. And you can pull this up in LifeSim. And each classification has a number of lanes, free flow speed, jam density, breakpoint density, and stop and go speed. And you can see those over here. Oh, and I think one more green shields power term. You see those over here. So it like occupancy type for structures. Um, the CFCC code stores all this information by road segment. So you don't have to define all of these parameters for each and every road segment. You just have to define your CFCC. This is all editable. So if you have your own classification system that you wanted to use, you can go into this table in LifeSim and update these CFCC codes with the classification system that you want. Uh, okay, so I want to take a little bit of time on this. I don't know if you all recall, but when I talked about LifeSim on yesterday morning, the LifeSim overview, talked about how it uses a speed density function to determine the speed of a vehicle as it's driving along, and the density of other vehicles around them determines that speed. Each of these parameters in here impacts this speed density function. So if your free flow speed is not 65, say it's 45, then it's going to max out, your, your speed density function is going to max, max out at 45. If your green shield power term go, it goes up, then this curvy part here is going to have much more of a curve. Um, and so it, it, the green shield power 
term defines the the Um, at state data for the major roads to look at the traffic counts and, and max traffic counts that would be expected. I look at the results and say, ah, oh, that doesn't make sense, or maybe it does. But if it doesn't make sense, I can go back in, look at the CFC for that, and go, oh, that's why. This is actually a three-lane road, not a two-lane road. And I can go in and adjust the CFCC on the, on the road network or adjust the number of lanes in the classification data. However, if you make a change in this part of it, you have to be careful because that's applying to all roads that share that classification type. Here's a shot of speed density in action. Oh, I think I gotta click on it. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's not playing. I thought I clicked it. Oh, here. Oh, oh. Quick animation, um, just showing the, the fact that, so there's not a lot of vehicles, right? So the density of vehicles is very low. You can see cars, they're coming in pretty quick and then they hit that, that off ramp and they slow down a little bit, right? So I'd say that again, a couple things at play here. One is you can see how that CFCC code goes from freeway to off ramp. So you see their speed immediately change as soon as they hit that off ramp. The second thing is that you saw them moving very quickly. So going to the next slide, if traffic is very full, then we see a very different outcome, right? So this is that speed density in action. You have a whole bunch of vehicles coming together, density is really high, they're stuck at stop and go speeds. And it doesn't really matter if they're on a freeway, they're not going to be able to go at freeway speeds. All right. Editing the road network. You can use our Mac to edit your road network, but there's a lot of tools in LifeSim that are ready to go that are going to help you out. Some of the common issues, connectivity. Like I said, um, the road network is defining how vehicles get from point A to point B. The, how they get from point A to point B, how they go from one segment to the next, is the endpoints of those segments have to be close together, okay, within two feet. So if those road segments are, if two road segments come together and their endpoints are within two feet, it's, life is going to assume those roads are connected and it's going to allow vehicles to traverse across. If the connectivity is broken, then it's up to you to go in and manually edit those roads to connect them and use snapping tools and whatnot to, to do that. One way to be able to identify these points, these points that are not, where they're not connected, is there's an option in Life Center to right click on your road network and segment. And that can be really useful in identifying places like this. Okay. Directionality is the next big one. Um, if you have a road segment on a freeway where all the, all the roads are in that one direction except one, like this case here, then that means that when LifeSim goes to simulate, it's going to assume no vehicle can traverse that freeway because once they get to that one segment, they'd be going the other direction. So it's an invalid network, therefore LifeSim won't actually evacuate vehicles along that road segment. And so you'll be able to simulate that, run it, animate it, and be able to view it, and dig in and figure out what's going on there. There's a tool in LifeSim to reverse directionality, so you can set up so the end arrows are set up, and then you can right-click on that road segment in edit mode and reverse the direction. All right, um, so one of the roads, like I said, you can draw end arrows by clicking in the properties, and then um, if it's yes, then it'll come in as red. So this is an, an example of what it looks like in the LifeSim software. So another example of where it might cause bad issues. Um, we have a couple of issues in this picture. One is one way the road's going in the wrong direction. So this just takes a lot of time and effort and it can be pretty monotonous to, to go through. Um, and then the other one is missing segments. So there are cases where you have missing segments. In that case, you'd have to add a new segment to your model 
make sure the ends are connected up proper, properly using the snapping tools. And then you need to, here's the key part that always catches almost pretty much everybody, is you go in, you'll add a road segment, good, I'm good to go, and then you'll call it good, save it, go to run it, and it'll, it'll fail. It'll say, oh, the simulation will fail, it'll give some error message. And the reason is because this road segment doesn't have attributes. So remember, after you've added any new segments, you need to go in and give it the attribution that's required by LifeSim in the attribute table. All right, um, I talked about vertical offsets. So here in this case, you see a road segment with a, that's going over a river, right? And you're looking at the street, uh, uh, Google Earth here, over here, you see that there's a river, it's a bridge. But LifeSim doesn't know that. LifeSim doesn't know this is a bridge, right? It just thinks it's a, it just knows it's a line and it has a CFCC code and some directionality. It doesn't know that it, the water under there is actually under it. So how do we do that? How do we handle that? We handle that with something called vertical offsets. It helps to, to uh, it's basically just you're offsetting the, the height of that, of that road to counteract the water depth. So here's how it works. If you have a bridge, you can set that vertical offset. So it's just a value, maybe it's 30 feet, whatever it is. Um, and then it's going to then calculate, okay, based on the vertical offset and the water depth, what's the depth on that road? So if the water depth exceeds the vertical offset by one foot, then you have one foot of water on that road. Make sense? Very clear. This is key because um, historically what would happen is, is if you don't have vertical offsets set for, for this situation, you'll have a bunch of vehicles driving up, seeing this road, oh my gosh, it's flooded, and then they'll turn around and try to find another route. Or they'll get trapped because there's no other, no other routes out. So it's really important to be able to capture these vertical offsets at your bridges, especially if you're, if you're running your, your hydraulic model so that it's, it's doing kind of standard flows and filling up all these channels in these areas before the big flood comes through. Uh, okay, some other common issues, um, midpoints. So I talked about the hydraulic sampling at roads. It's really important that you understand that hydraulics are only sampled at the midpoint of every road segment. So if you have a really, really long road segment, then you could have an issue where it's saying no depths occurring on that road, even though half of the road's getting flooded. In this case right here, you see half of this road segment is actually seeing water. So in that case, you probably want to split that road segment into two if that makes sense, right? Uh, another one, uh, shared endpoints. Like I said, LifeSim understands that uh, a road can go from one segment to the next if their endpoints are connected, right? If two segments are connected. So you can have, that can create issues. That's all LifeSim knows. So you can have issues where if you have an overpass and you have, you have those road segments terminating at that overpass, you can create a situation where vehicles will be driving along and they'll go, oh, that looks like a nice route, and they'll jump off the overpass onto the road down below and start evacuating along. So that's obviously no good. Um, so you have to make sure that road segments aren't shared, or the road segment endpoints aren't shared where, where they shouldn't be. So here's the example of the bad road. No, no, for this case, I would switch it. I would um, edit the road network so that these segments go extend beyond so that they don't share any endpoints, right? So back here, I would, or sorry, back here, I would do vertical offsets because it's a bridge. Um, but here, I would say, uh, sorry, here, I would say, okay, these shouldn't be connected no matter what. So I would set up the connectivity so that vehicles are no longer able to jump from this overpass down. So... By, by removing the fact they share endpoints, either extending these, this segment up, or in this case, it looks like the segment was extended up past and so on. All right. That's the end. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Is it worth it to add vertical offsets to every known overpass, so like a bridge over hot water? Yeah, I, I, I believe that it is. Um, and I often, when I get import from open street, It'll give, it'll give you a good estimate of which ones are bridges, which, which ones are um, bridges with water on them or not. 
So you can select by that and then go through and make set vertical offsets on those. Yeah. All right. So was, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. That's right. So if it's sampled in the midpoint, it's in that midpoint is dry, it's going to say that entire road segment's dry. So that's why it's a good idea to, um, if you have situations like that, split that road into multiple segments so that it gives a better representation of depths and velocities at that, at that spot, at that road. Yeah. Uh, first and then you, yeah. So the agents are deciding whether you cross a flat road road section or not. Mm -hmm. How does it deal with those multi-segments? Every time in life sim, every time a vehicle comes to a new road segment, then it's going to look at the depths and velocities at that time at that road and make a decision. If there's water on that road, they may still try to drive through, they may turn around, but it's doing it at every single segment, yeah. So what's the threshold for can you can you repeat that? Yeah. Yeah, it'll still be wet, but then um the a person's a vehicle's um decision making will be based off of the depths on that road. If it's wet, then they'll start deciding, okay, do I drive through it or not? And if it's dry, then um, then they'll just drive a, a no problem. Does that have a threshold for determining? No, no, it doesn't. Um, it's just going to calculate the depth on that road, the depth and velocity, uh, whether it be one inch or ten feet, and then the vehicle is going to make a decision based off of what the depth is on that road at that time. So it makes sense. Hopefully, I answered your question. We can we can talk offline. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you cut that on a section of road into like ten pieces, mm -hmm. ten of those are underwater, and it's one single stretch of road. Does that then that you're raising the probability that the car is going to turn around because you're rolling the dice on decision making so many times that eventually you're going to think I'm going to turn around. Yeah, but the difference the difference there is that that driver's depth threshold, their, their willingness to enter a flooded road, it's not changing every time they reach a segment. It's the same. So if that if they're driving along and, and that now you have ten segments, if they're go, driving through those flooded segments and they eventually reach one of those flooded segments that exceeds their threshold, then they'll turn around. Um, does that make sense? So it's a, it's a better, more refined. So the, the more segments you have, you're going to get a more refined simulation, but at the cost of runtime. Okay. Good questions, guys. Uh, any more questions regarding road networks? Yeah. Are the roads what? Yeah. Um, are the roads stopping? Oh yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, at every single intersection. Yeah, yeah. So when you when you pull in uh, for Deming, it's it's not a large urban area, but it's fairly large. So you'll see that every single little intersection is those endpoints that are connected there, and that's required. Like that's one of the beauties of like OpenStreetMap is that it's designed for traffic routing. So it's already set up so the endpoints are already connected. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they do once they reach it. Once they when they when they're about to enter that road, then the car will know what the depth is at that time on that road. Because how else can they how else can the driver make a decision if they want to drive through it or not? Until they reach it. 
When the, so the, here's the road, right? The driver's driving along. This has four feet of water. They don't know that until they reach and they, I mean, because then you can see it, right? So then the, the driver will know that car, that road has four feet of water on it, and they'll either try to drive through it or turn around. Yeah. 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 It, right, and, and my students pulling pulling the depths from RAS that are not the overtopping depths of the bridge structure. It, it's pulling the depths under the bridge, if that makes sense. And since, yeah, I, every every model I've seen from from RAS coming through, it's it's pulling the depths under the bridge, not the de not the overtopping depths of the structure. Um, you would see pretty significant depths in my sim, and depending on what you set your vertical offset to be, it may not overtop or it may overtop, right? So if your depth there is, is 10 feet, Raz is saying it's overtopping, but you put a 30 foot vertical offset, life sim is going to say, no, it's not. You still have 20 feet to go, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Good, good questions. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving on. Uh, we're going to switch gears into destinations now. So hopefully we, we kind of have a better understanding of, of how the road networks are used in LifeSim, how vehicles traverse from one to the next, some of the common issues, directionality is important, uh, vertical offsets are important, some of the options for importing. Uh, now we're going to switch to use the destinations. How do, the, how do people get to that point? What does that destination point mean? So destinations, safe locations that people are going to try to go to, right? So you're defining the points, the evacuation points that people are going to be trying to evacuate to. Generally, those are going to be major roads, right? Freeways, highways, the major arteries out of your area. You're generally not going to see residential streets used as major evacuation routes. So you generally would not want to put destinations there. Um, you import them as a point shape file. That's the only option for importing destinations. Uh, there's, I should say there's one more option. You can create a point shape file in LifeSim and just generate the points there and then import directly from that. But still, it's importing from point shape file. Like I said, groups will attempt to evacuate to the destination that they can get to the fastest. And destinations do not have to be directly on a road, but they need to be close. So, so when you're setting, if you're going in and you're setting destination points, they don't have to be exactly on the road line. They can be off a road, but you don't have to be you don't have to be perfect about it. And the reason for that is that license is going to, if it's a destination, license is going to search for the nearest road to that destination, and it's going to uh, put that destination on that road. Okay. They appear as yellow stars in the map. So when you've imp once you've imported them and added to your map window, you'll see them as big big yellow stars. All right, number of destinations is important. Um, Adam knows a little bit about this. Uh, on, the, on the left here, you see uh, Deming, our Deming model with a destination at pretty much every single possible road leaving the area. Maybe that's valid, maybe it isn't. Um, but generally, that's not how it works. People aren't going to consider every single possible road out they're probably going to take the primary roads. Notice that the simulation results with all those destinations is about 1,700. 1,700 because everyone has the best possible outcome. Over here, um, we only have two destinations. We have a destination up here, a destination up here. That's probably not accurate either. Everyone in the town of Deming it probably is not going to pick either this one or that one. And so in this case, too few destinations, we have quite a bit more life loss, right? It's creating a situation where you have major backup on the roads, taking people forever to get out. By the time they're on the roads, there's still, by the time the flood comes through, there's a bunch of people sitting in their cars. All right. Um, so looking at this, so this is back of that Deming model again, uh, looking at fewer destinations. So if we took our regular destination points and, and removed two of them on major roadways and then 
on the right side, we add those two. So in the squares, you can see the options. We're gonna look at the difference between those two. Um, okay, so the fewer destinations is the blue one. And you can see that life loss went up a decent amount, right? Just, this is just showing the sensitivity of removing two destinations in this model and, and the impacts that has just on that. Um, it can be pretty significant if like, if you have only one destination for a really large area and all vehicles are trying to get to that area, the more traffic congestion that's occurring, the longer your run times are going to be. So fewer destinations led to um, a de evacuation outflow that what I want to bring your attention to up here is you notice that there's a little bit of a gap between these two lines on the plot. I'd like to bring all your attention up here to this plot. So these, these two lines represent the number of people that most and determining if traffic congestion is heavy or not. Does that make sense? Looking down here, when there were more destinations, less congestion, but those lines are much closer together. I know it's kind of hard to see, but there you go. All right. Looking at the uh, individual outflow, you can see that, uh, so in Lysim, you have the ability to track the number of people that reached uh, various destinations over time. And this is really important when you're reviewing your results. I, I haven't um, really hit on this, but I need to hit on this time and time again, is that Lysim is an iterative process. Meaning you run your simulation, you review your results, identify potential issues, rerun, re-review, re identify, fix, run, review, and so on. Similar to RAS modeling, for all you hydraulic modelers out there, no one runs a hydraulic model once that calls it good. Same thing with life sim and traffic simulation. So in this, this is a, these are really useful plots for being able to identify Results are telling you almost everyone's going to that destination, then clearly you have an issue. All right, um, you can also, you can put a destination anywhere. Um, here's an example where you can put a destination. This is that, I think this is that high school, or maybe it's a hospital. I forget. Anyway, it's one of the, it's a, a pretty large building with a lot of population internal to the levied area, or sorry, the, the downstream of the dam area. And you can set destinations internal. So if you have like a superdome type structure, a place internal that you would expect people to evacuate to, you can set that inside of your model and then people will attempt to evacuate to that location. What does that do to your results? Uh, that can really change your evacuation outflow. So this, plot, this histogram is a total time evacuating for your groups. Yeah, question. We don't currently have a capacity on destinations. Yeah, so that's one of the challenges that you have to, that you have to worry about. And I'll talk about another challenge with destinations internal in a minute. Uh, back to your uh, destination part. So, couple destinations, I think, uh, they all know they are outside of the body error. That's because I don't want to understand that the body can continue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you would want to set up. Okay. This is, this is an example hydraulic model right, for our example, and you can see that glass wall, but it would continue flooding, right? Yeah. So you would want to set up. You would you would want to take that into consideration when you're setting up your destinations. You would probably wouldn't want to set destinations right outside of your hydraulic data where you know the water would continue. It was just stopped for the purposes of your analysis. That's a really good point. Did it, does everyone understand that? Makes makes sense. So this hydraulic model has like a glass wall where water where it just stops, but clearly water will just continue flowing. You don't want to set destinations right on that edge because that would end up being wet and people wouldn't evacuate to that location and then be safe. They would have to continue on. Yeah. Do I, do I, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, 
these are these are also really useful evacuation his, his time histograms to give you a sense of how long it's taking people to get out um, to reach a destination. And you see when we added that internal one, the close destination, people are it's about the same, but people are generally getting out a little quicker. Uh, that's because they can get to that internal destination faster. But here's the problem. If you look at this structure that we set our internal destination to, it's a single story structure. It's not a valid destination. This is not a safe haven for people to evacuate to. And so if you set this as your destination and that, that thing's going to lose its stability, you're putting all those people evacuated at that point in a high hazard situation. But Lysen doesn't know that. Lysen thinks that as soon as a vehicle reaches a destination, it's safe. And so it's going to remove it from that calculation process. So be very careful with setting destinations internal to your area, because if that destination is actually going to be flooded, then you probably don't want that to be a destination. All right, moving on to uh, destination assignments. When you set up your alternative, you can set based on which emergency planning zone you have. So you can have multiple emergency planning zones, each one with their own unique curves for issuing the warning. And you can define by emergency planning zone which destinations they will go to, those individuals within that zone. This can be really, really useful when you're setting up a model. Say, say that you're playing around with this Deming data set and you say, you know what, I want everyone on the northeast side of my model to evacuate on this freeway heading east. You can break out your emergency planning zones so that you just that area is going to evacuate towards the destinations east. Pretty useful. Another nice option, and, and we've used this before, is that if you have a destination that you want to set as like a secondary, this is a destination that you want people to only, only try to get to if they've exhausted their other options, you can uncheck them from this, from this case, and LifeSim will then say, okay, that destination's off the table for their initial shot. But once a vehicle's driving along and it's reached a flooded road, and it can no longer reach any other destinations, it's going to take out in any destination possible into account, even if it was unchecked in this box. So it's a really nice way of setting up primary destinations for your people. And then once they've exhausted their options, they can then consider those secondary destinations. All right. Um, okay, so we have destination assignments and evacuation parameters in the occupancy type editor. Uh, it's one of the tabs and it's per occupancy type. You can define your, um, some of your evacuations, your evacuating group size. This is the big one, okay? So if you have a school and you know the school is going to evacuate their students, they're not going to call parents to evacuate, you may want to set the evacuating group size for that occupancy type to 30, right? To, to simulate buses leaving that structure or a prison. I think we might have a prison in our model, right? Uh, fraction population that evacuate in vehicles versus on foot. As I mentioned yesterday, that's an important parameter if you expect people for certain occupancy types to be evacuating on foot. All right. All right, willingness to enter a flooded road. I talked about this a little bit yesterday. Um, when you run a simulation, every single vehicle is assigned a vehicle type, low clearance or high clearance, and then to assign that, that full, it's called fording depth, that depth threshold that they're willing to either enter a flooded road or not. You can get this through your detailed output. So you run your Monte Carlo simulation, thousands of simulations, and then you say, okay, this one had kind of high life loss. I want to know why. You generate detailed output for that individual iteration, and it'll give you for every single evacuating group, every single vehicle, the vehicle type, the fording depth, and a whole bunch of other parameters. So this can be really useful in determining why certain vehicles got caught where they got caught. This is some of the other uh, results that are coming out of LifeSend, the road summaries. So I remember generating, the, generating uh, the summary hydraulics yesterday for structure. your average life loss per road segment, and some of these other really nice um, uh, data, such as exposed under 65, exposed over 65, when that road first got wet, and so on. The when first, time to first wet, I use this all the time 
to determine which roads um, I think are bridges. Because if I if my hydraulic model is preloading, or pre, not preloading, if it's sending my, my just standard flow through to fill up the channels before the big flood comes through, those, those bridges are gonna get wet first, right? Because they're, they're over rivers. So this, this uh, time to first wet is a very useful parameter in identifying bridges. Another really useful parameter is um, when you generate the detailed results is per evacuating group, which destination did they end up going to? That can be really, really useful because it, it might not be the same destination that they would have started going to. So it allows you to start tracking where individual groups went and how they made their decisions. And once you start tracking that, then you can start tracking the animation, follow a vehicle along and say, oh, okay, they hit this they rerouted or they reached a traffic jam, they rerouted away from that destination and went to another one. So there's a lot of really nice tools in, in the life sim output to help you in, um, in better understanding your model. And if you better understand your model, you're going to be able to identify the issues better and make a better model and fix things that, that maybe you wouldn't see otherwise. Make sense? Some more summary results, uh, the road detail output table. So I talked about the road summary, that's going to tell you time to first wet, that's going to tell you average life loss per road. But what if there was one iteration where life loss on roads was a lot higher than the others? And you're like, why the heck is that? You can generate detail and start looking at, okay, which road segments for that iteration, what was the life loss per road segment? And you start really digging into the details, narrowing down and identifying issues or why that was the case. Maybe it was an issue, maybe it just happened to be a, a slightly less probable situation where higher life loss occurs. Quick animation just showing the, the impact of destinations when, when you have your simulation. You're all going to be looking at something very similar this afternoon. And that pretty much wraps up this presentation. Uh, are there any questions on destinations before we get into our check on learning? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, what you could do is you could put in a uh, going up the hill and and give them a, a classification of uh, something that's not your standard road, and then your people evacuating on foot could take that. The challenge though is that the cars might want to take that too, so it might be a little bit tricky. If you have a structure where you're expecting everyone to evacuate on foot, you set them on a desk so that they're pointing at a destination that's using that new walking path, and then they'll end up, the, you'll force them to use that path. Good question. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, um, the, the symbology shows them as cars the same as the others. You'd have to get it, pull up those detailed results tables, and it'll tell you if they're on foot or in vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. Can you determine how many hybrid vehicles as well as parents vehicles are there? Does it assume one vehicle per household? So it assumes one vehicle per evacuating group. Um, and that evacuating group size was defined in the occupancy type. So if you have a structure with three people in it, you evacuate in group size of three, then one vehicle will leave that structure when they evacuate with three people in it. If there's four people in that structure, two vehicles would leave that structure, one with three, one with one. Makes sense? Uh, and that's, okay, so there's a, there's a parameter in the, uh, I think it's in the alternative um, editor. That's a percentage of low clearance versus high clearance vehicles. And it might be in the occupancy type. Yeah, there it is. Uh, uh, was it this one? Yeah, it's not in this one. 35. This one? Oh, this one, yeah. So this is in the alternative. Thank you. This is in the alternative editor. And uh, you can define your, your fraction in low clearance versus high clearance vehicles. So you can set up different alternatives with different um, different fractions there. And what's going to happen is whenever a vehicle gets generated, it's going to do a random sample to see if it's a low clearance or high clearance vehicle based off of that fraction. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
create a product. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good question. I think, or thank you. Okay, no, thank you. I was just going to say, I, I think that I turned that off at some point. No, you cannot put two set two destinations on a single road segment. Does it does it throw does it throw a warning or does it just crash? Yeah. 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 Step one: don't have 180 destination points. <laughs> That, that that's that's the first issue. But, but we already talked about that. Um, okay. Any any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Deciding on the amount of destinations, like the Gambia code, where you just didn't have two destinations, and it, you know changed the life off a lot. Yeah. The rule of thumb is that we're going to start like it's a population, how much density, kind of size of the area, so kind of start at the best number of those things but kind of adjust from there yeah so so here's how here's how i here's how i approach it is i set the destinations on primary roads and first and i set them pretty far away from my study area because i want to be able to simulate the the traffic beyond just my inundation extents and so primary roads behind your study area because if you set a whole bunch of destinations all around the edges with on every little road Eventually, those people are all going to filter into these primary roads. So set them on these primary points way outside of the area and let the software figure out how they're going to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So Adam is like, so what you will do is, what I would do is I would set those primary ones up, run it, and go like, ah, people would, would really be filtering off of this, this little like, side street or this, this little non-primary road south or whatever, and then you could set a destination there. So that's part of that iterative process. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for that I might maybe set up a separate EPZ for that for that neighborhood and, and set the destination assignments up slightly differently. I think that would be the best the best approach there. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So you, that's what I was saying. You want to definitely make those destinations far out enough so that the traffic backing up doesn't in like you don't want to have a destination right outside where they're safe and it doesn't include that at all. You want to be able to capture that traffic backing up into your potential inundated area. Um, so you, so I generally set the destinations far enough out to where it's going to capture that. Um, like with the Orville model, uh, setting a destination in Chico was it was valid because all that's a lot, quite a long distance. The traffic was backed up that entire time, and then once they reached Chico, that's where a lot of lot more options become available for those people. So it captured that back up pretty well. If that helps. Yeah. Uh, for a large group of people, you are creating you know, like schools, for example, hospitals. That's assuming that. Uh, that, that's right. So, yeah. So that takes a that's a, that would takes a little bit of um, research work to determine if the school, prison, hospital has those resources and they have a plan to do that. Oftentimes, if they don't have the resources or don't have a plan, even if they have the resources, they don't have a plan. They still wouldn't do it. So you have to. Apply that only when it's the most most applicable. Like my kids, they wouldn't be bussed out because they go to a school that they don't have a bus system. In Davis, there's no bus system, so so Davis kids are they all going to be picked up from school. But some schools have a bus system and they have a, a method for for getting people out. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So what 
most of our towns are in rural area of mountain. Um, makes sense to keep uh, those ninety percent high frequency. Yeah, 90 might be a bit high, but but yeah, it definitely makes sense to use a, a higher value. And I, and I recommend doing that, running it, changing it, running it, see how sensitive your results are to that parameter. Um, my guess is it wouldn't be super sensitive, but yeah, I would say depending on where you're at, it could be a lot higher than 50%. Yeah, yeah last question. Yeah. How does the program determine if they evacuate away or evacuate up? Yeah, so, so there's a couple of things that help determine that. One is, um, remember on that protective action initiation function, so the warning goes out and warning gets issued. A certain percentage of the population are not going to evacuate. Try, they're not going to try to evacuate by road. So those ones are just going to vertically evacuate. Um, some of the other things that help determine is when when a group is ready to evacuate from their structure, they look at the depth on the road that they're going to start on first. They look at the traffic congestion on the road they're going to start on first, and they look at the depth on their structure before they start. And if if it's all clear, then they go for it. But if the road they're going to start on exceeds their threshold, or the structure that they're at exceeds the threshold, then they're going to go, nope, it's too late, we're going to try to vertically evacuate. Or stay. And, and it, it depends. Uh, it, so it's, it's all random, right? So we don't know exactly which individuals are going to stay and which ones are going to go. We just know roughly the percentage of our population that's going to stay. So the, the software is going to determine roughly 80 or 90 percent, whatever that max mobilization rate is. They're all going to try to leave if they can. Yeah. Yeah. And it does that for each individual agent, keeping the community percentages appropriate. All right. One more point before I get to that check on learning is you have to be really thoughtful with your destinations because remember, vehicles are going to try to get to the destination they can get to the fastest. So if you set a destination right smack dab in the center, every vehicle, pretty much every vehicle is going to try to get to that destination because they can get to that one the fastest, right? So you got to be thoughtful with, with your destinations. This one down here probably is only going to try to collect a few, a few of these structures, right? Because, because anybody up here, the only reason they would ever try to get down to that destination is if all of their other options are, are taken, right? That's the only reason they would ever consider this one. So be thoughtful with your destinations. Try to make sure they're roughly equally spaced. Look at those results afterwards to make sure that you have traffic flowing to the destinations you expect, and then adjust as needed. All right. Check on learning. Which of the following statements is true? I'll read this way so I don't have to stare up. Groups attempt to evacuate to, a desti to the destination with the shortest travel time. Groups attempt to evacuate to the destination closest to them. Groups will not attempt to travel on flooded roads. Or groups cannot evacuate to destinations within the inundated area. Hey, that's right. Anyone else think any of the other ones might be also true? Good. Very good. All right, everyone get that, right? So, so C, groups will not attempt to, that's not true because they have that willingness to enter threshold. So it's sometimes true. Right, yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, uh, road classification data and evacuation parameters are editable, true or false? Good. All right. One more. Pick the correct ending to this statement. I can choose where and how many destinations are in my life's model. Therefore, I should put a destination on every road leading out of the inundated area. Adam. <laughs> uh, B. Always put at least one destination within the inundated within the inundated area. C. Place destinations in locations that people would reasonably evacuate to during an emergency and run multiple iterations if necessary to determine the appropriate placement and number of destinations. 